Hey everyone, welcome to Unreal Fest. My name is Jeremiah Grant, and I'm going to be talking to you today about building modular characters. Briefly, uh, who am I? Uh, I am the Technical Product Management Director for Animating and Rigging in Unreal. My path here uh, led me back and forth through games and film VFX, working on some pretty incredible projects. Uh, my focus has always been on character development, though, generally as a rigger or a creature TD. So what is a modular character? Well, on this slide, we see three different versions of modular characters, one from Fortnite, Echo from some of our demos, and a metahuman. Uh, what makes them modular is that they're made up of components, like the head or the body or the feet can all be separate and modified uh, uniquely. This has a lot of advantages, like if you need to tweak the hair, you don't have to change the face or change the hands. Uh, or if you want to wear the same hairstyle on multiple characters, you can have the hair separate and use it on multiple characters. Uh, metahumans are a great example. If you open up one of those, you'll see there's hair, uh, head, body that are made up of different shirts and pants and shoes. And uh, by mix and matching those, you get a very diverse and broad uh, collection of characters from those components. So we're going to start by opening up Project Lyra uh, which is our demo for UE5, available in the marketplace. And we're going to download a free uh, character kit called the Stylized Character Kit uh, Casual Mail 01, uh, also available in the permanently free collection on the marketplace. And using these two, we're going to build modular characters in a variety of ways together. All right, let's do it live. Now that we have the engine up and Lyra loaded, we can see what we've added here. Uh, I've added a metahuman that we can take a look at a bit later. And I've added in the stylized character kit from the marketplace. Uh, in the demo folder that I created here, we can see uh, what we'll be creating. Uh, in the viewport, you can see I have, I have a character and it automatically generates uh, random outfits for the, the character. And a little manager uh, blueprint that lets me uh, re-randomize my outfit and toggle on and off some uh, accessories at runtime. If we want to see all of this running, I can go to Edit, Editor Preferences. And in the Lyra project, there's already a cosmetic, uh, a very lightweight cosmetic system set up. Uh, there's uh, videos that go into detail about how this is set up, but uh, for now, I will show you how to add your own character to it. In this case, we're going to do our um, modular, what did I call this guy? Modular, modular male. That's the blueprints that I just showed you here. And if I press play, minimize this, you can see they have different characters, and my character is able to run around. All right. If I escape out, if I drag in my manager, play again. I can, by pressing N and M, change my uh, my outfits for all my characters, as well as toggle on and off. Okay, so let's build it. Let's let's do it from scratch. Um, very first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to right click, create a blueprint class, just an actor, and I'm going to call this B. A modular character. All right, now obviously there's nothing in here, so let's get some uh, character parts in here that we can work with. I'm going to go into this model folder that is created and, and contains all the content from that stylized character kit. Add in, let's say, an accessory, some hair, a beard, a head. We'll do some pants hands, and a shirt. I'm just going to drag this into my blueprint. All right, already we have something that looks like a character. Uh, it can't really do much, but uh, it's a good start. I am going to uh, start by just adding an animation to these pants. I'm going to go to animation mode here, set it to animation assets, and I'm going to choose an idle animation. All right, so animation is playing on this. 
Unfortunately, it's only playing on the on the legs, but it's a starting point. Uh, something to note about this specific stylized character kit is it is all uh, based on the UE4 Epic Skeleton, and they're all using that exact same skeleton reference. So when we're playing this idle animation, we're playing that uh, third person idle from UE4 on our character. OK, so obviously we want this animation to play on the entire character, and we'll get to that here in a sec. Before I do that, I want to uh, rename these parts so I can understand what they are a bit better, and I'm going to move them into a hierarchy that makes some more sense. So here I'm going to say I'm going to rename this lower body, and I'll name this upper body. Name this hands. this head. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Beard. Hair. And finally, I'm going to call this face accessory. It might be earrings, it could be glasses, it could be all kinds of things. And then I'm going to parent this into kind of a structure that uh, the, the body would be built up from. In this case, the upper body is always going to be attached to the lower body. The hands are probably always going to be following the upper body. Head is probably going to be following that upper body as well. And the beard, hair, and face accessory are going to be following the head. There we go. And once again, even though I made these changes, and if I play my idle animation, we still see only the legs moving. All right, so if we go into the construction script. We're going to build uh, what is called the leader pose. In uh, previous versions of Unreal, this was called a master pose. It's been renamed to leader pose. If you're looking for it in a previous version, uh, that's what it'll be called. And uh, essentially what it does is it takes in uh, meshes that you want, skinned meshes that you would like to follow one specific uh, leader. In this case, we want all of these to follow the lower body. So I'm going to say my lower body is my leader, and all of these get to go along for the ride. I'm just going to connect all of these up individually. Now what's really interesting and cool about this leader pose component is it's only going to evaluate lower body and it's going to copy in memory or, or reference in memory the, the exact bones of lower body onto the rest of these, uh, these meshes. If there are bones, for instance, in hair that do not exist in lower body, they will not be visible. Um, in fact, they will not even evaluate. What that means is that this is uh, hyper performant, it's very fast, uh, and uh, allows you to optimize a lot of uh, animation where, where necessary. There are some downsides. For instance, if you have a ponytail, uh, you in this specific structure, you need to have that ponytail bones in all the way in lower body or upper body. We're going to get around that here in a couple minutes. OK, so now if I go to my viewport again and compile, Let's get back to that animation assets. There we go. Now we have our idle animation playing on everything. Oftentimes, you want to attach various items to your character, maybe uh, weapons on the hips or a backpack, for instance. In this case, I created a backpack using all of my modeling skills here. And you see, it has a complete custom skeleton, uh, does not share any bones with our default uh, character skeleton. So we're going to have to find a new way to attach this rather than using that leader pose. Uh, all this is is a backpack root and then a couple bones for the straps so that these straps can be animated. I want to animate them with physics, so I created a physics asset as well. This is just a kinematic body and simulated bodies for these straps so those can swing around as my character runs. I'm not going to go into uh, all the details of setting up 
a physics body or a physics setup, uh, but I will link a great talk about creating physics assets from scratch later at the end of this video. Okay, so let's add this backpack to my character. I'm just gonna drag it in like we did before. And I want it to sit on my upper body, so I'm going to move this under my upper body. And in order to attach this, I'm going to use sockets. Uh, if I just press this browse button, it's going to list all of the bones that exist under the parent of this. In this case, it'd be the upper body. And let's move it on to spine three. Well, okay, that's close, but not quite right. And it looks like it needs, it's sitting directly on the bone of spine three. We probably want it to be offset, so it's sitting on the surface of the, the character. I can manipulate the transform here to move, move it in and out. Uh, but maybe if I have this backpack on a different character, or if I uh, if my upper body changes to have maybe a really thick coat or no coat, um, I'll want that backpack transform to adjust accordingly. I don't want to have to continually change this value in order to accommodate different upper bodies. So let's get around that by creating a new socket on this. Opening up the skeletal mesh, you can see our whole hierarchy here. And if I right click on spine 03, you can see I have an add socket option here. I'm gonna click that. What this does is creates a transform under that bone that I can manipulate and attach things to. Let's rename this attach backpack. And we will move this to the surface, something like that. And go ahead and go back to my blueprint. Now, when I select my backpack and choose this browse button, you see I now have attached backpack. Let's go ahead and click it. Hey, there we go. Uh, so this is still sitting there, um, but it still needs to be rotated. So let's go back to this and rotate it 90 degrees. There we go, pops into place, excellent. Now let's get these straps uh, animating. I think I accidentally left that set up, so we will clear this from scratch. Okay, so we have our backpack moving. Uh, just to show that you can modify uh, these at the same time, I'm going to pull this window off. And with my socket selected, I can manipulate that socket and see it move in my blueprint. Okay. Oops, there we go. Now I'm going to go back to my backpack. I'm going to right click on the skeletal mesh and choose Create Animation Blueprints. I'm going to call this ABP for Animation Blueprint Backpack. I'm going to open this up. And let's create a very basic graph. Uh, first, we want to take in whatever the place this backpack is located, uh, so its pose, and apply that into this animation blueprint. In this case, it's gonna be essentially where it's placed on the back. I'm gonna say input pose. Now with input pose, uh, if anything was animated on this before this animation blueprint is evaluated, we will see that uh, pose come in through here. So if I were to place this backpack in sequencer and then have this animation blueprint run on top of it, I should have that animated uh, sequence come in and then uh, be able to act upon it. I'll get, on the, uh, get into that a bit more here in a second. Next, I wanna add my physics. So I'm gonna say rigid body. And let's connect these up. Select them all and press Q just so that I make these lines nice and pretty. And with my rigid body selected, I'm going to select my 
Well, it's taking a second here. All right, so I'm going to click the drop down here and I'm going to choose my backpack physics that I created previously. There we go. Now, a quick tip for uh, being able to debug this stuff. And, and like when you have a physics asset and you want to be able to manipulate it and see if it's working, let's go ahead and right click and add a transform modify bone. Transform. Uh, there we go. I'm going to connect this up to that root bone. Bone to modify is going to be our root. And I'm going to set translation mode to replace existing compile. Now, whenever I select this node, I get a manipulator in the viewport and I can. Oh, there we go. Move it back and forth. And you can see that those rigid bodies are simulating. That's just a good uh, quick tip. I'm going to disconnect this because I don't actually need it for this to evaluate. Uh, one more thing to note, the reason I'm using a rigid body node here instead of assigning the physics asset to my skeletal mesh is I have a lot more control over this rigid body. I can adjust the physics and customize that. I can tweak how much motion from my character is getting applied to the physics. For instance, if my character teleports you know, 100 feet to the right, I don't want my physics to start jittering and exploding. So instead, I can imbue forces uh, and limit how much force is applied to those physics through these properties. OK, I'm going to save this animation blueprint. And let's talk about how I'm going to apply this. I can apply this animation blueprint in two different ways. The first with the skeletal mesh assigned is I can uh, change this animation class to be that backpack I just created. And that's a, a very viable way to do this. Um, basically, whenever this, uh, whenever this backpack is spawns in this blueprint, it will run that animation blueprint, and those physics will move. But we're going to do this a different way. We're going to use the post-process animation blueprints. You can see it here in the asset details, or you can just search for post. Post-process animation blueprints. It's just an animation blueprint that will run after every other pose uh, has been passed through. So previously, I mentioned you can animate this in sequencer. And if this post-process blueprint is applied, then this will simulate on top of that animated uh, sequence. If you had applied it just through the blueprints like this, then the blueprint would be overridden by the animation uh, in the se in sequencer. So this lets you layer on simulation on top of animation. OK, let's compile. See what we have here. Look at that. We have some, some light simulation happening. Let's change this to something a bit more dynamic. We got some some physics moving. And you can see there's not a lot of motion. Maybe we want to add a bit more motion to this. If I go back to this animation blueprint, and I am going to increase the amounts that that component movement gets applied to the physics. And I'm just going to between zero and one. I'm going to say half the component movement. Let's apply to that simulation. Well and we should see uh, more movement happening in our blueprint. There we go. We're getting a little bit more. Now we're seeing those sway back and forth. Awesome. OK, you can stop running now. So now we have a character. We have. Uh, animation applying to the entire thing, I can swap out parts of my character. For instance, if I go click on my hair and I change this to a different hair, I'm still able to see my whole character um, running around if I were to change this. In fact, let's, let's just go back and do that again. See, I still have the same hair. I can click on my upper body 
change this to something like the coats, and we still have everything working. What if I want to have some sort of customization on parts of my character? When I saw this jacket, I thought that it was a, a really cool way to, um, to get some simulation on the collar. It has this really thick collar, it has some other things like zippers and stuff that would be fun to get some movement in. Um, but I don't want to have to modify my core skeleton. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at this custom shirt I created. This shirt has uh, variable collarbones that I've created. I'm just going to disable uh, post the graph I had already applied. Figure this out. We'll walk through it together. Okay, so uh, you can see I added bones for the collar, so I can animate those. Let's turn off my snapping, and you can see I can now manipulate my collar. And I went ahead and deleted a bunch of bones that I didn't really care about, like the finger bones and the leg bones that I don't need for this shirt, just to keep this really streamlined. I also created, uh, when I when I created this, I created a unique skeleton. So it's not sharing a skeleton, it has its own skeleton called Shirt Collar Skeleton. Now, if I want these bones to animate, um, let's go to the blueprint and see what happens. I'm gonna change my uh, upper body to use my new collar setup. There we go. Now we didn't see anything change here, um, but let's see what happens when we look at our bones. I'm going to do show flag dot bones space one. That will now show all the bones that are in this viewport. Okay, well this is interesting. We see the backpack. We can see that custom skeleton, and we see this cyan-colored skeleton, but we don't see the collarbones. That's kind of weird. Um, let's change this back to a different shirts. Yeah, we still don't see those. The reason we don't see those is because we are using this leader post component. Previously, I had mentioned how uh, it's only going to use the bones from this leader from the lower body. And that lower body does not have any of those color bones. So if I take upper body and say, you know what? You don't get to follow along with the leader anymore. Disconnect this. In fact, let's move it out of the way and compile. Now I see those color bones. In fact, if I select different uh, character, or actually let's just go ahead and change this to a different shirt. There you go. You can see the different bones swapping out depending on the bones that were applied to each of those uh, meshes. All right, so let's go back to my collar. There we go. The problem, though, as you may have guessed, is when I go back to my animation, now it's not following along anymore. Let's fix that. I go to my shirt collar rig, and I create an animation blueprint. Now, I've already created a couple of these that you see in the folder, but we'll create a new one. Let's say collar, uh, let's see, you can say shirts, collar. Uh, Open this up. Okay, so I can do a few things here. Let's start with exactly what we did before for the backpack. Input pose. And let's do uh, the rigid body. Connect this up. Usual, select them all, press Q to make everything pretty. Pretty graph save lives, people. And I created a physics asset for this as well. Let's apply that. And I'm going to go ahead and bring in some forces and compile. You can see these physics 
uh, bodies right there. Let me go ahead and open up the physics assets so you can see what I created. It's just a couple static bodies for the bones that are going to be moving uh, by animation, and then some simulated bodies. These are just collar, uh, collar bodies that are, are boxes that to flop around a little bit, give a little bit of motion to this. Okay, so I'm going to save this, and I'm going to apply it to my shirt. I'm going to apply it to my shirt here using this blueprint, since we basically want it to follow along with our character. So I'm going to choose, let's see what we call this, color demo, and compile. Well, I did something wrong here. I think what I did wrong is I used input pose. Why did it work on the backpack and it doesn't work here? Well, the answer is, because there's no pose being fed into this. And in fact, the, what was feeding in the pose previously was this construction script. It was, we were getting the pose from our lower body. Uh, when we applied it to the backpack, all we were doing is moving the roots via this attached backpack, um, uh, via this attached backpack socket. So we didn't actually need to uh, pass in a whole pose. So to get around that, we're going to go back to our demo and we're going to use a different pose. I'm going to right click and choose copy pose from mesh. Copy pose from mesh is a really great node that allows you to pass in skeletal information from one skeleton to another. They don't have to be the same skeleton. It'll do a name and hierarchy match instead. Disconnect the input pose, connect copy pose from mesh, and compile. So this, we just saw those still flap around. That's great. Clicking on the copy post from mesh, you can see a few settings. The way that this works is it takes a source mesh component. Uh, so our source in this case would probably be the lower body, uh, same way that we use for leader pose. And um, then it will take, pass it through the graph like before. You can create a graph and, and uh, derive this source mesh component from anything if you'd like. This can get pretty complex, but the easiest way is just to select this node and enable use attached parents. This attached parent is derived from our blueprints. Remember when we created this hierarchy, it'll say, hey, upper body, what are you attached to? Oh, you're attached to lower body? Great, I'll automatically get that for you. I'm also going to enable copy curves and copy custom attributes. That means if there were already any curves on the lower body, uh, for instance, maybe you have um, facial curves they want to pass through or um, some morph targets that, that make the muscles flex when you, when you are dancing, those curves will get passed all the way through to all the children. Okay, I'm going to compile. Save again, and let's see what's happening. Hey, there we go. So now everything is running as expected. You can see the colors moving back and forth. Let's go ahead and turn off the show flags dot bones, and we get to see our whole character running around. That's pretty straightforward. We were able to add some physics to our character uh, without modifying our base skeleton. Those physics react to uh, the character's movements, and we even have a backpack with some straps moving. Now that we have uh, the full character working with uh, some simulation on the upper body, we have a backpack attached that has some simulation as well. Uh, we're able to swap out any of these parts whenever we'd like. Taking a look at faces, uh, faces often have their own complications. If I open up the skull mesh, we'll see that this uh, face already has some morph target curves uh, that can uh, play some expression. Oftentimes, we'll see heads need uh, much more complication or much more additional complication than the rest of the body. For instance, bones for the jaw or the eyes 
or anything else that you want to manipulate on the face. You don't really want to carry all of those bones and all those curves around on the rest of your body parts, so often you'll have a separate skeleton with its own animation blueprints uh, to carry that weight. Let's see what that looks like in practice. So here I've already created an animation blueprint, and we're going to treat this as if it has its own skeleton. And I'm just going to create a copy post from MeshNode. It should be familiar. And I am going to enable use attached parents. We'll compile. And we'll assign this to our animation blueprint here. And if we press compile, nothing will happen. And that is because currently the head is still uh, following the leader pose. I'm going to disconnect this and compile again. There we go. Now we see everything seems to be working as expected. Now, if I take this character, I'm going to go ahead and save this, and I place it into the world. There we go. And I'm going to add this to a level sequence so we can experiment a little bit. I take this character, drag it in, and I press, press the, the plus track. Right now, I'll need to say press plus on the head for the scale mesh, and I'm going to create a control rig. In this case, this control rig that I created uh, a little bit earlier. So you can see that here I'm manipulating um, this control and it's changing the facial expressions on the face. Let's reset this. Now, if I just have the actor selected and I press plus, note how there's no control rig option, no way to animate this character without diving down into the components. Let's delete this and I'll go and delete the character. We can resolve that by First off, taking uh, the lower body and making that the parent in, uh, instead of the default. Now if I compile, go back to Sequencer, and pull this character in. Now when I press the plus, you'll see I have control rig. If I assign this uh, face rig again, just to the default there, Now we're getting something completely different. So what's going on here? Uh, neither of them seem to be working correctly. So, well, th there's a couple things happening. First off, uh, the head is attached to the upper body. And so when we are using this copy post from mesh, use attached parents, we're pulling from upper body. If you recall, we're using this custom skeleton, shirt collar rig, that has its own custom skeletal mesh and skeleton. And there are no curves here. So even if we were copying the curves from lower body to upper body, there's nowhere for those curves really to pass through. And finally, in our head, we're actually not copying the curves. So let's go ahead and turn these on, compile, see if anything changes. Nope, still nothing changes. OK. Going back to our animation blueprint, we can do a couple things. One, we can take the head and parent it to the lower body so that those curves pass through without having to go through the attach, uh, through the upper body. I'm going to try that. Pilot. And now when I manipulate, see it moving all of the things. So that's great. Uh, and something else we can do is um, instead of, of parenting this head to the lower body, we could keep it under the upper body. And this gets a bit more complex. We could use the blueprint here in the event graph to uh, dive down, figure out what the, uh, the lower body or what we'd say kind of the, the, the lowest common denominator skeleton is and pass that in to the source mesh component rather than use attached parents.
Uh, before we move on to the next section, I want to show that control rig that I uh, demoed there briefly. I'm going to go into models, demo, and we'll look at this control rig. The way this control rig is set up is I've created a vector control and a float control. This vector control just moves in X and Y, now puts an X and Y value. And this float control just moves uh, up and down, generating the float value. When this control is moved uh, up, up and down, it generates um, a positive one to negative one value. And the same thing on Y, positive to uh, one to minus one. And then we're just remapping that to uh, zero to one drives anger on X, minus one to zero drives fear, zero to one drives joy on Y, minus one to zero drives disgust. And then for the blink control, the, it's just driving the wink. This set curve value in the control rig is uh, setting the curves that are already on that skeleton mesh. So it's directly driving these curves. So that is how that control rig is set up. Now that we have a full character, let's see what it looks like to uh, run around. And before we do that, let's see what it looks like uh, by default in Lyra. Uh, in my editor preferences, I have uh, a few settings here under Lyra Start a Game. If I go to Lyra Developer Settings, I can set a default experience. And in this case, I'm using Elimination. So once I press Play, I'll be in that mode. I can also override the number of uh, players that are going to spawn and let me uh, let the bots attack me or not. So for now, we'll leave these on. I'll press play. There we go. Now we're spawning as the mannequins. We can shoot, we can jump, and dodge. All right. Now, if I want to swap out uh, these characters for my new character, I'm going to need to do a bit of setup. Um, in order to see how these characters are currently set up, uh, I'm going to show very quickly how the mannequins are set up. As quickly as I can. So I'm going to go into characters. This is Lyra, content characters, cosmetics, and you'll see a couple blueprints here. I'm going to open up B template, which is our UE4 mannequin with a sphere on its head. And you'll see this is a very basic blueprint. It just has a skeletal mesh and a static mesh. The static mesh is using the head as a parent socket. Um, but if I select the skeletal mesh, you'll see I have an animation blueprint applied. Let me browse to this animation blueprint. Oops. There we go. We'll open it up. So this looks pretty similar, but instead of a poppy pose from mesh, it's using retarget pose from mesh. I'm not going to go too deep into what retarget pose from mesh does uh, or how to set it up because there's some videos that talk through this in greater detail. But I'll give a quick overview. Similar to copy pose from mesh, it has use attached parents, and it takes an IK retarget asset. If I open up this asset, we'll see I have uh, our UE5 mannequin and our UE4 mannequin. Any animation that I play on the UE5 mannequin, so let's choose an emote, will retarget to the the child uh, the child actor here. So in this case, the UE4 mannequin. And the way it's doing that is through this retarget asset, this IK rig asset. This IK rig asset uh, basically defines limbs on the character. So you can say, this is my right arm, this is my left arm, these are my legs, these are my hips. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff already defined in here. Now, you don't need to recreate these from scratch every time. In fact, uh, if I open up this, the so if this is the source, which is the UE5 mannequin, and the target is UE4 mannequin, you can see there's a lot already, uh, already defined. And since all these bones and all these names already exist on uh, our current character, 
you can swap it out. So let's see what that looks like if I were to swap out. Uh, let's see what they're called. We will choose one of these pre-made ones. We'll go back to my emote. And you'll see my character retargets without me having to recreate a new IK rig or retarget asset. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So going back to my settings, my editor preferences, in my Lyra Cosmetic Developer settings, I can say cheap cosmetic character parts and expand this. And I'm going to say in plates that blueprint we just looked at. When I press play, we all spawn as this character. And we see all the animations still work, holding a weapon. So what's actually happening under the hood is it's spawning the base hero character. And uh, that character is what's playing all the animation on an invisible skeleton. And then using that cosmetic override, it's retargeting that invisible character onto this blueprint. So let's use that same knowledge and apply it to our current character. In fact, let's go ahead and assign our character here, uh, the modular character, and see what happens. Okay, well, um, I mean, that's kind of okay, but not quite right. And the reason is because right now uh, we don't actually have that retarget pose for mesh set up. So I'm going to open up this blueprint again. And on the lower body, we just have an animation asset. We're going to clear this out and create a new animation blueprint. So one more time, let's go back to our characters, and I'm going to create for our lower body a new animation blueprint. And I'm going to call this uh, EVP um, modular retargets. There we go. And I'll move this back into my folder here. And we'll open it up. In our animation blueprints, I'm just going to right click and say retarget pose for mesh instead of copy pose for mesh. Retarget pose for mesh, connect up. Remember, since this skeleton, and not the, the exact skeleton asset, but just the hierarchy and the name of the, the skeleton will automatically work with our previously defined IK retargeter assets that come with the project Lyra. So I'm going to choose this retarget UE5 Manny to UE4 Manny asset. This comes with the Lyra project and uh, use attached parent is already set. And I'm going to compile. In my blueprints, I'm going to assign this animation blueprint. And I did EP retargets. Oops, I think it's modular, modular. There we go, modular retarget. If I compile my character, I won't see any movement yet because right now it's just playing uh, an empty retarget. But if I play the game, I should now see my character running around, holding the backpack, still being able to aim and shoot. Now, we can always refine this, but this provides kind of the, the concepts, the basics. All right, so now that we have our own character running around and firing, let's see what else we can do with this character. It would be pretty cool if whenever I spawned, I would spawn uh, a different outfit. So let's set it up. Let's set up uh, where it will generate a random uh, outfit from some sort of collection uh, every time this character gets spawned. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable. Um, oh, let's do it this way. I'm going to say I want to spawn different uh, upper body every time I, I recreate this blueprint. 
I'm going to just drag off of my upper body and create a new variable. This way, I, I know exactly what this uh, type is. And I'm going to call this, um, let's call it upper body parts. There we go. And rather than, I'm going to go and delete this now. Rather than having this as a single uh, variable, I'm going to make this an array and compile. I'm going to put a small collection into here of different upper bodies. So the first one we'll say, um, oh, I think this should be a ref asset reference. Now that I have a character that's built up of modular parts, let's make it so whenever the character spawns, it can spawn a random output. Start by creating a new variable, we'll call this upper body parts. And this will be a collection of uh, pieces. And in this case, we have the uh, bear tested, the t shirt, and our collar. We'll compile this. Uh, this is a variable type of a skeletal mesh. And I'm going to create a new function as well. I created a new uh, event called randomized outfits. We'll call this and our new function to generate a new outfit per body part that we love. We'll call this random part. And this is going to pull in a random part from our list. We're going to set a new there. A new local variable called random mesh. There we go. And rather than uh, only pulling from body parts, I'm actually going to just drag in that array and that'll create the appropriate input type. I'm going to call this mesh options. Go ahead, I'll just pull this in and say set skin assets and save. Once again, I'm going to pull that off and drag my target into a function to create the appropriate input. And we'll call this um, part mesh. And I think I prefer this order. There we go. We'll drag this. Drag this. There we go. So what we've done uh, so far is we have uh, a function that takes in a part mesh and a very a variety of options, and it'll pull a random mesh out of this array and store it in this variable. Uh, it'll take in uh, a part mesh. In this case, this is going to be would be our upper body uh, component right here, and it'll reassign it to this random mesh. Now, the reason why I'm storing this other variable is each time this random function is called, it will pull a new random uh, mesh, and since we're going to be uh, using this random mesh multiple times in this function, we want to make sure that we're always using the same random mesh. Right now, uh, the way this function is set up, we will just be reassigning the skeletal mesh. We want to make sure that whenever this is regenerated, the correct materials get assigned as well. So let's do that now. I'm going to see what materials are currently assigned to this mesh. And for each one of those, we're going to assign it to our uh, part mesh here. Right click on this, flip truck, and say set material. Oops. 
want to do set material. And this is going to be our parts. And the slot name. So just to uh, reiterate this again, we have uh, generated or uh, pulled a random mesh out of our out of our available parts. So in this, and then we store that as a variable. We're going to override our part mesh, so upper body, with our new random mesh, and we're going to get whatever materials were assigned on this random mesh and assign them to our new upper body. All right, we're going to compile and save. And in our uh, event graph, in this new event that we created, let's call random parts. We're going to pass in our upper body parts into our mesh objects. And we're going to pass in our upper body uh, component into our mesh that we want to override. And to start out, to make sure this character spawns a random outfit at the beginning, let's call this uh, this new event in our construction script. The viewport, and as I compile, we now get a new random outfit. There we go. I pulled the same one a couple times in a row. Uh, one thing to note now is in my uh, built mesh components here, I'm not going to have an animation blueprint assigned here. Instead, I'm going to be assigning an animation blueprint to each skeletal mesh in the post-process graph, like we did previously. That way, whenever this, uh, the skeletal mesh is spawned, it brings along with it uh, the behavior on how to connect to uh, the rest of the character. So you can see I've already taken these uh, skeleton meshes and assigned a very basic copy pose from mesh uh, animation blueprint. Uh, we've made this already before, so I didn't create it from scratch here. Copy pose from mesh using the attached parent and the copy curves. And, and something like this is assigned to each animation blueprint, or sorry, each skeleton mesh. In our shirt color, for example, it has the shirt color animation blueprint we, we created. Uh, so we also get the simulation on the color. So let's go ahead and save this and play the game and see what happens. All right, so now we're actually seeing uh, a couple different variants spawning on our environments. Let's expand this one more time and uh, add a couple more options. I'm going to duplicate my upper body parts call this one hair parts. Let's do one more and call this pants uh, or uh, lower body. Okay. All right. Our hair parts, we'll add a couple options. And let's do AO1, oh, AO2, and AO3. AO2 and AO3. There we go. And we'll delete this. Now I can duplicate the function and then pass in our hair parts and our hair. Now when I compile, I should get a random hair and a random shirt. In this case, the uh, hair is already being attached using the set leader pose. Uh, and uh, so I'm not having a, a custom animation blueprint assigned. Let's extend this function so that you can allow nothing to be applied. Maybe you want to be able to have your character be bald and not always have a hair option applied. We're going to 
tweak this a little bit. And add a new input. I'll allow nothing. Uh, if this is true, and we're going to randomly generate the Boolean. So if we allow nothing uh, to be applied, then we'll, um, we'll be randomly generating a, a true or false. So this will determine if nothing is applied. And the way we'll do this is we're going to use a select here. Change this index to a Boolean. So if both of these are true, then we will assign nothing to our skeleton message. If it is false, then we will assign this random mesh uh, that we have generated here. And apply that to our new mesh. And let's see what that looks like. So right now, nothing is happening. The reason is the default for that Boolean is false. So no matter what, I'm not going to allow nothing. Let's make our make it so our hair can generate enough. Now, if I compile, there it goes. So sometimes we get hair, sometimes we don't. Let's adjust this character so we can toggle on and off something uh, specific. I'm going to create another event that will toggle on and off our backpack. Let's call this toggle backpack. And let's call this off. Say sets. Uh, visibility. And we're actually going to do this twice. We're going to say get visibility. All right, so all this is going to do is say if the backpack, or if we call this events, get if the backpack is visible, and apply the inverse of whatever it is. So it'll always know if I'm visible, make it not visible. If I'm not visible, make it visible. Let's create a manager now that we can place in our scene to uh, change the visibility of that backpack at any time. And create another um, actor blueprints. And this will be our new manager. I'm going to call it B, character manager. Right, whenever we press the N key, We will gather all of our our uh, modular character blueprints. This is the, our character blueprint that we created here. We're going to gather all of them that have been spawned in the scene. And for each of them, we are going to call that new backpack toggle. Toggle back. And I'm going to compile. Oops, I'm going to pass in my character. Compile, save. And let's drag this manager into my world. Press play. And now I should be able to. Oh, uh, the reason this isn't working is because Uh, Lyra already has a bunch of keyboard uh, input settings, so I need to make sure that this uh, blueprint is able to take input. So I'm say auto receive inputs. For now, I'll just say player zero. And now, if I play the game, I should be able to. There we go. So now we're able to change the visibility of parts on our characters. I want to change 
only the uh, the random outfit on my own character, we can do that as well. Instead of getting all of the actors, I am going to hit player pawn, get all child actors, there we go, and for each of these, I'm going to find which one is my modular character. Do the modular character. So all I'm doing right now is I'm trying to see which of the children of my of my pawn is my modular character. And once I get that, I'll be able to call my uh, randomized outfits. So if this fails, we are going to go back into the execute. And if this succeeds, then we are going to break. this and say randomize outfits pass in my character and we should be set to go let's connect this up to our I press play and we'll change the backpack for all my characters and M will randomize only my player character. Now that we understand the concepts, let's see how that applies to metahumans. If we open up a metahuman blueprint, this is IO, you'll see a very familiar structure to what we just created in our modular character. We have a body, some torso, legs, feet, face, these are all just module, modular pieces that are uh, combined to make a cohesive character. Metahumans are already set up with some of this behavior. In fact, if you go to the, uh, the variables and go to library target, there's a use library target mode. If you enable this, this is going to swap out the animation blueprint behind the scenes to use a retarget pose for mesh. The exact same thing that we used for our lower body. If I go into my editor preferences again and look at the developer settings, I can choose IO and now run around as that character. There we go. It's just a modular character. Even though it looks scary, it has a lot of uh, complications to it. At the end of the day, it's just using all the concepts we discussed here. If you want to start modifying a metahuman, you all you need to do is exactly what we did before. In fact, let's go ahead and try uh, adding a backpack to our metahuman. I'm going to add a skeleton mesh. We'll call this backpack. Let's move it under my torso. And let's assign our backpack we created earlier. To recall, we need to add a pair of socket. And if we want to adjust our uh, sockets, we can always uh, do so in the skeleton. Uh, for now, though, I'm just going to offset it here since I showed it previously. There we go. Pretty close. And and compile and run around. There we go. Now I've already attached some objects onto our character uh, using the same techniques, uh, applying it to a metahuman. The same can be applied with uh, things like the collar that we went through, or if you wanted to add custom armor onto this character, you would just use everything we discussed during this talk.
Thank you for joining this session. And if you'd like to know more, uh, there are several links that you can uh, take a look at, including how to set up uh, rigid bodies and cloth simulation, how to animate these characters inside Unreal, and where we're taking a lot of these tools in the future. All right, thanks for joining, and I hope to see you guys create some incredible modular characters in the future. Bye.